Okay, we're at Mountain Gardens. It's about May 12th and we want to show you nettles. There's two kinds of nettles that you can eat in the spring. They're both quite delicious vegetables and extremely nourishing. Good sort of spring tonic foods. So we have Urtica dioica, the standard stinging nettle that you read about in herb books. And we have the less well-known Laportia canadensis, also in the nettle family, the Urticaceae, woods nettle. I'm not sure the range of the woods nettle, but it's all over here in rich woods. The places that have ramps and squirrel corn and trout lilies and may apples and all those bloodroot and trilliums in the spring, if you go back in the summer, there's a high likelihood that what you're going to find is a solid population of woods nettle. It really favors those situations. Uh, the stinging nettle, on the other hand, which we have back here, so you would not normally find these in the same location. You would find this in the rich woods, you would find the stinging nettle, Urtica dioica. Uh, I see it in alluvial soils, like nice meadows along the river, uh, French Broad River, very common all through Asheville, over into the town of Marshall. So it wants a lot more sun. If you try and plant this in the shady conditions where this one will thrive, this one will die out. Uh, Laporte, on the other hand, will do fine in the sun as long as it has a good moisture retaining humus -y soil. Okay, so uh, if you're out in the woods and you want to pick this to eat, uh, one thing is, it's going to be in rich woods with wildflowers and so on, and there's usually going to be a lot of it. It's not going to be a kind of an isolated plant. There isn't a whole lot you're going to confuse it with, and it does sting a little bit, but not much. I mean, I'm not managing to get stung here. Later in the season, it stings a little more. On the other hand, you can see the little potential stinging hairs on it. A major look-alike that you might want to worry about would be this one, rough snake root, the plant that killed Abraham Lincoln's mother. Gone down in history as that. Uh, this is Eupatorium rugosum, white snake root. Eupatorium is an important genus with Joe Pye weed and bone set and other things in it, but this one is a little bit toxic and specifically in the colonial era it caused milk sickness when uh, cows that were just free-ranging would graze on this, their milk would become slightly toxic, mainly to infants and old people, including evidently Abraham Lincoln's mother. So it probably took them quite a while to figure out what the problem was. So there's a fairly easy way to distinguish these two plants, there are a number of ways, but the most obvious easy one is that this is alternate leaved and this is opposite. So because this is opposite, each their, the leaves are in pairs, equal pairs. Because this is alternate, they're not pairs. They're like small, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, going down the line. Let's see. Alternate versus opposite. Uh, I can't think of anything else, and this wouldn't kill you, but I can't really think of anything else that you would be likely to confuse this for in the woods. So when I want to eat it, I just go through with a, with a pan and pick off the top three or four leaves. There's frequently a color change between the fresh new leaves and the older leaves. These are oftentimes a lighter green and you can see the, the uh, way the light reflects off the veining is a little different from the leaf down below. So I would just pick like that much. That much and just drop it in your saucepan and there's uh, you know about two minutes you've got a mess of greens and they do cook down a lot you want a big pile of them but this is stuff is so dense that you just pick 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 so great plant to know my favorite spring vegetable of all actually you just need to basically wilt it a little bit uh, just get some grease butter oil bacon whatever going and rinse the herb a little bit just to put some water on the leaf, even if you probably don't need to wash it, but just get a little moist, throw it in, put the lid on, let it steam for a minute or two, it all wilts down, and, and that's it. Good to go. Now the, the urtica is a little bit different. The urtica is also found in uh, pretty dense populations. 
This one's a little bit invaded with other stuff. And this one there's no problem by identifying because it really does sting. Get into some nettle and just feel it up a little bit and you can confirm for yourself that you got stinging nettle. Although it doesn't sting as bad this time of year as it does later on. Uh, this stings enough that it's been used uh, therapeutically for arthritis and things. There's a counter irritant, sort of similar to the bee sting therapy, and I believe it does share some toxins with bee sting, formic acid. And I don't know what else. So this will grow in dense patches. Uh, that one I just pick with my fingers. This one I'm a little more careful. Uh, I might just hold the tip of it and cut it with a pair of scissors and drop it into a dish, but since they're often even heights, I Develop, I made this uh, nettle harvester, so it's just some fins on a, a hedge shears, and you can clip it and drop it into your basket. So if you're collecting a lot of nettles, might be good for a few other things too, but nettles is the main one we got it for. So you just want the top, again, four or six leaves. Uh, these are both really good fiber plants, and of course, if you harvest them this way, you're not going to get—they're not going to be so good for fiber because wherever you cut them, they're going to branch. So you're not going to get the nice, tall, straight uh, stalks by autumn time that will give you the nice long threads. So you can make a choice. If you want to use it for fiber, just set some aside and don't harvest that for food. But most of the time, we're not making fiber out of these, although it was a major. Uh, fiber crop in colonial times, homespun, a lot of it was nettles. Samuel Johnson has a quote about going to England and I forget what all, eating nettles and sleeping on a mattress stuffed with nettles under a, a sheet made from nettles and on and on. It's like the uh, herbal equivalent of bamboo as far as having uses. Super high in vitamins and minerals, this is the source from which uh, Chlorophyll, if you want to extract chlorophyll, they use nettles so high. They probably have to sting to defend themselves because they're so nourishing. Everything in the world would want to eat them. During World War II, the British were worried about their food supply and they did some research and found out that nettles is practically the most nutritious thing you can grow. So they said, oh, no problem, we'll just live on nettles. Well, it turns out they only grow in really rich soil. like. Everybody thought it was a wasteland weed. They grow at the end of the field where all the rocks are piled up and all the junk and weeds out of the field. Well, the, in fact, those are super uh, high uh, nitrogen environments and the wheat and nettles are just flourishing and, and dying down and fertilizing themselves. So, uh, Both of these plants like to be really well fed and they really repay uh, your efforts. Uh, let's see, so one final note I could add about nettles is that they're really good to dry. And this would be the time of year to get them. You want to, we're, we're just about at the point of stopping harvesting. When they start to flower, supposedly there's too much nitrogen, it's hard on your liver, kidneys, excreting. Anyway, you're supposed to stop eating them when they start to flower, which is also when they'll stop being delicious because they're stopping making new growth. What you're eating on these tips is just the new growth. They'll be tough. Uh, you can still use them as a herb tea. You can still use them as a hair rinse. Terrific hair rinse. Make a decoction from this. Uh, but right now, before the, the end, you can make a big harvest, dry them, and then powder them, and add to pretty much anything you're making all winter long, especially soups and stews. Uh, they add a nice flavor and add all this nutrition. We don't, there have not been so many studies about the woods nettle. I suspect it's just as nutritious. And at the moment, my friend Joanne McCoy has a grant to study the nutritional quality of American Indian traditional foods. So hopefully very soon we'll have information about the nutritional value of this. So here's what the urtica looks like in the autumn. This is second growth coming up. It's already flowered and gone to seed. Now we're getting a second crop, so all parts of this plant are useful, including the root. I believe the root is, in particular, is used for uh, prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate gland, along with 
things like saw palmetto and small flowered willow herb. So the seeds have their, their uses, the, the uh, leaves and stems have their uses, and the root has its uses. And then the roots can also be used to propagate the plant. So it spreads quite readily by the root, technically a rhizome. I'm sure an uh, underground stem. This is all connected up underground. This root is going way back in there. So, that's how it operates. As I said, this part is a rhizome, an underground stem, but this would be the part you'd use medicinally. These are the actual roots. These are the feeder things. So, you can see, readily propagated by, so if I chop these up and make separate plants, and probably even pieces that don't have a top could make plants. Uh, that's called propagation by division, and this is a very easily divided plant. There are some little sprouts coming up from this node. I suspect that every node, there's a little sprout starting up from this node. I suspect that every one of these nodes is capable of making a new plant. There's one there. So that's Urtica dioica. A very, very important medicinal herb. Food, superfood.